I believe that there's a, a certain element of the in, in my 56 and a half or almost 57 years of study. I, you know, you could probably put it in a, into a classification where you could say that there is these natural phenomena that we have that unexplainable that we can't we don't know about. And a lot of those get reported as UFOs. And then it lets us to now get into the Tic Tacs, right. the real UFOs, you know what I'm saying? The structured craft that are out there that are doing things that we, we really want to know more about. You know, when we were in Cloverdale, we did have that, you know, thing with the tree and you yeah. guys analyzed that for me. That was, it was pretty cool. You know, do you remember that? Oh, I remember that. That was so interesting because it's like, you know, you had all that uh, cameras going on and, and it was only, I believe, if I remember correctly, it was only in the infrared, right? It was the infrared and it just was the one tree yeah. in the whole right. picture that was lighting up. Yeah. And so that one tree, and it, but my point was it was, it was in infrareds, which means that it was like, it was not in the visible and, you know, and you're looking at your clips and trying to see if you can see other kinds of things that would match. And there was nothing. And here it was in the, in the, uh, in the IR, it was showing up that this, it was almost like the top corner of the tree, at least from the top, it looked like it was like being lit by something maybe above and bingo, you know, it's like lit up and yeah. what's there and there's there's really not and you remember that there was like nothing in that whole area and uh nothing at all there's there's no anything you know and it's like so what makes this thing do that well you know the only thing we can say is you know that whole area there's a lot of strange anomalous stuff happening and it's the cloverdale lights right now, right right maybe you know you could talk just a little bit about that real quick rich like do you think that there is any connection to the Cloverdale lights and what we saw happen with that tree, perhaps? Well, perhaps I mean, it's potentially, uh, you know, possible, very possible. Let me, let me put it to you this way. So the, the, since 1973, there had been a whole bunch of these like lights that were seen in the area of Cloverdale, Alabama. And it's just, it's over in the very Northwest corner of the state. Uh, it's located about maybe, I want to say about a half an hour North of Florence. <laughs> And, uh, and you have a situation where the, uh, the, the, they had a lot of the people who live in the areas were seeing these kinds of uh, lights that were moving sometime along the ground. And the next thing you know that they would be popping up in the air and two guys had been out there for like years documenting this stuff. And they're, they range from some of them are relatively small to some of them being as, as big as eight foot in diameter. And it seemed like that they happened more frequently you know, in the colder months uh, than they were. In, and they tended to be a different color in the summer months, if you would. There was a different distinction there. But so they had been around the area, documented certain areas where the, this phenomena was seen. And the next thing you know is that we're out there with the teams trying to be able to see if we can identify them or see them ourselves and have as much in the way of camera kinds of things. We even had drones. We had a whole variety of uh, measuring equipment to be able to be out there to, uh, to get temperature readings because we thought well, maybe humidity was playing a factor. We had looked at the uh, groundwater. There was a lot of groundwater out there in ponds. Well, guess what? A lot of those ponds we found out had sulfur. And one of the ingredients that you see from the spectral analysis of these kind of like lights is that it has a component of sulfur. Okay. And so even in Hestelin, you had that. In, uh, in other parts of the country, you see that that's uh, a, a component of that. So we kept thinking, okay, well, the salts, maybe sulfur water is belching out something. But imagine a round light and it's not lit on all sides, which means that you could be looking at it on one side and it's not lit. And the other side, if you were to get around it, you would see it lit. And so it's not, uh, you know, it's, it's almost like it's unidirectional light versus omnidirectional light. And so 
Uh, there were reports in, in 1973, also in Piedmont, Missouri, when uh, they were doing a study of lights like this over there, that they had a person who was up on an aircraft flying over who couldn't see it, and the people on the ground could see it. And so, you know, again, lighting is not the same and uniform all the way around it. So that's interesting. So uh, potentially, uh, and by the way, these things moved uh, mostly on an east to west or a west to east fashion over in that area. And so what makes that happen? And they fly against the wind. And so it's like if they fly against the wind and they can get a speed of about 20 miles an hour, uh, why isn't wind impacting them? How are they doing that? And that's worthy of study too, right? So from a conventional standpoint, it's not like we believe that these are intelligently driven. Uh, we look at them as a natural phenomena, but what makes this natural phenomena behaving this way? And we would get a lot of scientific understanding by just spending time studying that, right? And atmospheric scientists you would think would be engaged in this. And uh, so that's where we were trying to be able to get some information on it. I was comparing uh, and contrasting what we had in Cloverdale with there's the Min Min lights in Australia. Uh, and then you had the Piedmont case, which was well documented by Harley Rutledge in his book called Project, Project Identification. And so again, there needs to be continued sharing on that and study because I think that there's something legitimately there and you got a chance to see something that was rather odd where potentially you might have not been able to see it visual, visually, but it was there and it was actually generating something in the trees that you were able to pick up on the infrared. Is it possible, Rich, that maybe the light was there, as you say, we couldn't see the light, but it was shining down on the tree somehow. Correct, yeah. And so that's, that, that's within the doable. And, uh, and I think that, you know, had we had a visual sighting of the light, maybe as it was hypothetically like rotating around or something like that, uh, that maybe we would have been able to have been sure and then the problem was that the camera was also kind of like only focused around that area and it potentially was outside of the range of the camera, which was doggone it, you know, we wish we had that, but, but, you know, so we don't really know and we can't say for sure, but, you know, it's like one of those things where it's extremely interesting. And I remember we went over and we tried to like, see if we could shine lights and various other things to get the same effect. We couldn't, uh, we tried to look at the fact that there was a power line that was there and maybe the, the transformer was arcing or something of that nature, but that wasn't the case. And so nothing really made any sense, but yet you had that video footage showing that kind of like strange anomaly. Uh, but, you know, this phenomenon seems to be all over the world. And there's kind yeah. of all your, your garden variety names, like you've mentioned and I've said, but there's even more places where uh, you hear stories. It, it, it almost seems that this phenomenon is repeating in many different places around the world, Rich. You're, you're precisely right. And, and so, you know, while these one, these little areas that I'm talking about that I was able to throw out are like, you know, maybe repeatable. I believe that there's a, a certain element of the, in, the, in my 56 and a half or almost 57 years of study, uh, you know, you could probably put it in a, into a classification where you could say that there is these natural phenomena that we have that unexplainable, that we can't, we don't know about. And a lot of those get reported as UFOs. And if we could, if we could hypothetically get a better understanding of what's in the atmosphere doing that and, and understand how they work and what they do and how they operate and how they form and whatever, it might be a, a way to rule out them as IFOs, because we now know what they are. They're a natural phenomena. And then it lets us to now get into the Tic Tacs, right. the real UFOs, you know what I'm saying? The structured craft that are out there that are doing things that we, we really want to know more about. But the problem is that these objects, they're often called orbs and other things that people report them as, you know, are, are often potentially natural phenomena that we just don't understand and that if we can eliminate that from the pool and people get an understanding, you get where I'm going, right? We could actually now focus on the structured craft like the Tic Tacs that are out there. Uh, and, but, you know, as well as I do, the IFOs far outweigh the UFO reports. And people see, I mean, we're having to deal with, spend our time investigating a case that's actually the planet Jupiter. 
and we're spending as much time on that that we are on the UFO. And it's like, this is crazy. You know, we need to be spending more time on the UFO, the unknown one, and, and, and less on the IFOs out there. And, uh, but you have people that are taking pictures with their cell phone camera and they point it at a bright light and you get the little blue orb down there because it's nothing more than a lens flare. Lens flare, right. And we get, we get so blasted many of those things because people have cell phones now and they're pointing them at bright objects and they get them and they say, oh, look, there's a UFO. You know? So, I mean, and then it, you then add in the drones, add in the other kinds of natural things like, you know, uh, aircraft that might be classified or experimental or whatever like that that are up in the air. And it, it gets me nuts because there's so many IFOs out there.